Hello everyone and welcome to the weekly webinars um, by Mind of Leap, which are going to be run every Wednesday from 8 to, to 9. Um, today we're going to be joined by Dr. Samso, who's going to run the session on hypoxia. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end, um, run by Wendy. So please make sure to put all the questions in the question box um, during the session. And then if you think about anything at the end of the session, we're happy to answer all the questions. And you can also post them to our Mind the Bleep webpage. The session is going to be recorded and we will send out the link for you to access the materials if you registered at mindofbleep.com slash webinar registration. And I'm going to put that link in the, in the comments box in a second. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to hand over to Dr. Samso to talk about hypoxia. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so today's webinar will be on hypoxia um, and we'll discuss a bit, a bit about the history, investigations, diagnosis and management, um, a bit about hypoxic emergencies and just to introduce myself, I'm an F2 doctor working in the West Midlands. Um, I've had a respiratory placement, so um, I know a little bit about hypoxia. Um, and also just to add, uh, make sure that you fill in the feedback forms at the end if you'd like a certificate uh, for proof that you attended, you'll be provided with that. So let's crack on. Um, if you've got any questions, you can post it throughout or at the end, and I'll ask questions throughout and feel free to pop the answers into the chat box. So just to start with then, what we'll go through, like I mentioned, hypoxia, respiratory failure, a couple of chest x-rays, ABGs, and a few of my tips. Why are hypoxic emergencies is important. Um, I'm sure you, you know hypoxia is life-threatening, so we need to make sure that we are aware of what we can do and what to look out for. And don't be scared to put out an emergency peri-arrest call if you're really concerned about a patient and you don't know what to do, or they're deteriorating and you're not too sure how to, how, and you need some help, basically. Okay, so ways it can present, here's a few different ways it can present and uh, things like agitation, you can read their saturations um, and they have obvious difficulty in breathing can be signs of hypoxia. How you'd assess it, how you would always assess a patient, um, Dr. ABCDE approach. And just remember that um, with, high, with oxygen, hypoxia will kill before hypercapnia. So if you're worried about patients um, having low oxygen, make sure you start them on that 15 litre non-rebreathe mask to really pick the oxygen up. And then if you're thinking about them being a CO2 retainer, et cetera, which we'll discuss, you can always titrate the oxygen down afterwards as you feel appropriate. Um, so a bit about airway, uh, I'm sure you're all aware, head tilt uh, and jaw thrust. So if someone's airway is compromised, these are what you do. You might use an adjunct like a nasopharyngeal airway or a Gidel. Um, things like noisy breathing, coughing, etc. These are all signs to be aware of. Now, I'm not sure if you've come across these patients, but there's patients who have tracheostomies and laryngectomies. Um, there's a few indications for them. For example, patients who you might have encountered if you have been working in ITU. So uh, patients who are being weaned off the ventilator may then require a tracheostomy to help with their breathing uh, because they need that extra support. So a tracheostomy will then be connected to the ventilator, ventilator machine and then they'll be provided with oxygen in and out to help with their breathing. So if there's an airway emergency here, patient is saturating, they look red, flushed, panicking, think about hypoxia and how are you going to manage it? Call your seniors, especially if you're not sure how what to do. Bits about the anatomy and what to do. Tracheostomy, remember that there's a stoma in the neck. So a stoma is an opening. Stoma in the neck in, through the trachea. A laryngectomy is where there's the stoma through the larynx. And just remember that in a tracheostomy patient, there is still a connection between the mouth and the windpipe, whereas, uh, and the lungs. Whereas in a laryngectomy, there is no connection between the mouth and the lungs. So if you're going to oxygenate a patient in a, uh, in a tracheostomy emergency, 
you'd oxygenate through the mouth and the stoma when it comes to a laryngectomy patient. You could do both, but what's going to be useful is the oxygen going through the laryngectomy stoma because that's the one that's linked to the lung. Okay. Um, so just moving on then, breathing. Remember position to provide oxygen and examination. Uh, examination is really, really important. So um, just having a quick overview on things. Remember your inspection per patient, percussion and um, auscultation. Some key things to look at, end of the bed, how are they? Are they using their accessory muscles, their intercostal muscles? Are they panting away? Are they now tired? Are they, uh, do they have a reduced respiratory effort? Um, make sure that you have a listen to both sides of the chest. And remember the lungs start off at the front of the chest, okay? And then they go posteriorly towards the back. So the lower lobes, you'd be better off listening to them at the back, particularly the, uh, the bases. So you can hear for crepitations, crackles, here for any wheezes, particularly if they're asthmatic or COPD, but here for a wheeze, if they do, you may, may need to give them some nebulizers. Uh, that could be salbutamol, could be um, hypertropium. Sometimes saline nebs can help with secretions as well. Um, is there tricky essential? Uh, has there been a pneumothorax? Um, and really important one, check the, check the legs and the feet for peripheral edema. Could be a sign of fluid overload in which case you really need to make sure you're checking these things. Okay, is there bilateral air entry? Really, really important as well. PCO2, we'll have a little chat about as well, um, just moving on, but uh, carbon dioxide, it's really, really important to be checking on the ABG. So we'll talk a bit about ABGs and VBGs, but CO2 is a really important parameter to check because if a patient is um, retaining too much carbon dioxide, if there's someone who relies on the um, on that, uh, if they rely on their hypoxic drive, they're retaining too much carbon dioxide and then they're retaining too much oxygen, they'll go into type two respiratory failure. So we'll have a discussion about CO2 a bit more, but just remember that's a really important one. So this is what I was just mentioning. So I'm sure you're all aware what oxygen saturation do patients need to be on? Is it 88 to 92? Is it 94 to 98? So patients who you're going to consider putting their target saturations to 88 to 92 are those who are at risk of type 2 respiratory failure or those who already have type 2 respiratory failure and you're managing them acutely. Um, the reason being that if someone, these patients who are at risk of type 2 respiratory failure, um, and if you know what that is, pop it into the chat box uh, and then we can check uh, what that is if you've got that right. And you can pop the difference between that and type 1 respiratory failure if you like. Um, remember that patients might rely on their hypoxic drive to breathe if they've um, been retaining carbon dioxide for a long, long time. Their body is used to that higher carbon dioxide. And in, 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 in other people, we rely on, or they might rely on having high carbon dioxide for their breathing. Whereas these those who retain that carbon dioxide rely on having a not so high oxygen for their breathing. So that's why we need to aim with a lower target and that will help them to keep up their breathing. And these are just some patients to be aware of who you might have to um, reduce that target down for. But always discuss with your seniors if you're, if you're not sure. So a question now um, for you to answer and you can put your answers in the chat box and we can go through it. So Trace is a 70 year old, got a background as stated, including COPD. She's on the ward, you're on the respiratory ward or say you're on AMU, she acutely deteriorates, tachypneic, um, she's got a, a high heart rate, um, so tachycardic, blood pressure is okay, saturations are low on four litres, breathless, in distress, sweating, uh, and you think she's having an exacerbation of a COPD. What would you do? How would you investigate? So see what you can write in the chat box and we'll, we'll go on to that. Fine, so we will move on. Um, I'm sure you guys probably got that chest x-rays, ABGs, bloods, and your respiratory exam to start with. And remember, if you're really, really concerned, you can always ask for more help, okay? It's better to have more people than, than uh, being concerned and doing everything yourself, okay? So you do the ABG and 
with regards to ABGs, I'll give you some of my tips in terms of doing them and how to be successful near the end of the webinar. Um, but you get these results. So which one out of the four do you think it is? Um, I'll add it down in the chat box. Um, you can do A, B, C, D, E, going from top to, bot top to bottom, and then we can go through it. So in terms of normals, pH normal is 7.25 to 7.35. O2, you can think about as being um, greater than 11 is normal. PA, CO2, 4 to 6 is the normal range, and bicarb, around 22 to 26. Um, so uh, let's move on to the answer. Type 2 respiratory failure plus respiratory acidosis. So well done um, for those who got that right. And even for thinking about it, if you guys are taking part in the questions and thinking about it on your feet, it'll be really good practice for you when it comes to real life and having to think on your feet. Um, so it's a respiratory acidosis because them having a high carbon dioxide, I'll show you the acid base equation later on, but having that high carbon dioxide pushes that equation to the other side. They make more H plus, and so they become more acidotic as a result. And it's because of that CO2. Bicarb's pretty normal, um, and we'll go through how that might change acutely and chronically. You also notice there's pedal edema. So edema in the feet, and it's up to the ankles. There's reduced air entry as well as a raised CVP. Breath sounds are diminished, diminished. So thinking about all of these things, how are you going to manage the patient? And let's just say that the patient was pyrexic as well. So pop a few things down uh, and we can go through uh, what you might do. Okay. So remember um, all the different parameters, oxygen, medications, short-term, long-term, what might you do? I'll move on. So these are a few of the things that you might do. So 15 meter mask initially to really get that oxygen from 80% to, um, to you know, at least above 90%. And then think about titrating it down. Maybe after a few minutes, um, you'd use a Venturi mask. And when you use that Venturi mask, don't just use a, don't just um, ask the nurse or use that venturi mask and leave. Make sure you're asking the nurse or whoever is doing that to, to also look at the oxygen saturations whilst they're on that venturi mask. So maybe they start on a 28% mask. Are they saturating good enough on that or, is, or are they still saturating 85%? In which case you'd have to go up. So make sure you don't titrate the oxygen mask with the saturations. If you also might start those uh, IV quick acting 40 milligrams to get rid of that edema. Maybe if there's fluid in the lungs, that's, that's really going to help. Salbutamol nebulizers, ipotropic nebulizers. So salbutamol, you can go with 2.5 milligrams uh, nebulized, okay? And that takes place over a few minutes. Ipotropium, you can go with 500 micrograms uh, uh, and, and you can go like that. And then in terms of antibiotic cover, you may want to give doxycycline, but follow your guidelines. Um, if you think it's an infective exacerbation, say you had crackles or this pyrexia and you're worried about infection, prednisolone oral, um, and also actually um, you may want to give um, an IV antibiotic for quick acting. But again, look at your guidelines, especially if they can't swallow, you know, you can't give them PO. So think about these different things because patients are always different. There's always individual circumstances you need to consider. Prednisolone, so steroid, so that's going to be quite important and it can actually work within hours. Give that as an oral dose and if they're particularly unwell, you can think about giving an IV dose, but ask your seniors about that if you're considering doing that. Okay, and senior input, really, really important. So question, how long would you try maximal medical therapy for a patient who is in type 2 respiratory failure before you consider moving on with your management. So say you've tried all these things and it's still not helping. How long would you try before you think about the next steps? Would you, is it a few minutes, hours? Are we talking days? Um, what do you think? And if you get this, uh, then you really are doing well. Um, I'll move on and I'll give you the answer. So it's one hour. Really, really important. You have to try and sort 
the situation out in one hour as best as you can with the maximum medical therapy. So that might be back-to-back -back nebulizers. So you might give the salbutamol and ipratropium nebulizer once. You have a look at them, you reassess. They're not improving. You might give them another set of nebulizers and then another one. Um, you This is what back-to-back -back is. And then after one hour, if they're still not doing well, then um, you think about what we call NIV, uh, which you may have heard of. It stands for non-invasive ventilation, which is BiPAP. So um, that's going to help them in type 2 respiratory failure because it gets rid of the carbon dioxide and also helps to oxygenate them. Um, and particularly, you would do that if the patient is still in type 2 respiratory failure with that respiratory acidosis and it's not resolving. Okay. So like I mentioned, that's what NIV does. Now, in terms of examination findings, we can go through it tac tactically. So what are you hearing? Are you hearing anything? And are you hearing any crackle? So these are the different differentials. I won't go through each individual one, but some of the key ones to go through, uh, I'll have a quick go at. So just a quick, quick overview. You are going to have a future webinar on chest X-rays, but just a quick one. Um, just to remind you, remember Dr. A, B, C, D, E, so D for details, R for ripe, so rotation, are the clavicle symmetrical in their size? Inspiration, can you see enough of the ribs? Um, picture and then exposure. A, B, C, D, E, airway, breathing, circulation, diaphragm, and then everything else. So this is just one technique you can use. And this is just an image of an X-ray anterior and posterior ribs, uh, scapula, and so on and so forth. Now, what do you think is going on here? Type it in the chat box um, and I'll, um, and then we can go through it. So you have to look quite particular um, and type in what abnormality you think you can see and then we can go through that. Um, and again, if you, if you get this, then uh, you're doing very, very well. Um, so see what you can find in this chest X-ray. I'll give you a few seconds. Um, remember, look at your airway, your breathing, circulation, diaphragm, and then everything else. Okay, so is it normal? Is there something going on? Let's have a look. Oh, right, so it's actually a case of retrocardiac pneumonia. So if you got that really, really well done, so you can see there's small rounded airspace opacities. It's behind the heart. So what I found quite helpful is um, if you can't quite see it, it's sort of at the bottom of the heart where you can see the border between the heart and the diaphragm on the chest X-ray. Um, and a way that you can help to look is if you're on PACS, which is a system a lot of, which you might use in your um, trust, invert the image and then you may be able to see the opacities a bit more clearer. So that might be helpful. And just remember, look at the costophrenic angles, look at everything else. So well done if you got that. Um, let's crack on. Um, what does this chest x-ray show? A little bit easier. Um, let's say it's a 50 year old uh, gentleman and he's got a background of uh, hypertension uh, and it's common with a cough for one week, productive of green sputum. So these are your findings, and these are what the answers are. So you've got consolidation in the right heart border zone, and therefore you can see that it's not very distinct. It's sort of um, made it unclear, the right heart border, and that's because there's a pneumonia going on there. And pneumonia, you can class something as pneumonia when you actually see on the chest X-ray, okay? You can see the left heart border quite clearly and you can see the diaphragm, the costophrenic angles very clearly, nice and sharp. So you're not too worried about consolidation there. So presenting this, you could say the details of the PA chest X-ray, you'd say PA if it was PA. Remember in AP, you can't really comment on the heart because it might be magnified. Um, is there any rotation? No, clavicles are quite symmetrical. Adequate inspiration, you can see enough ribs there. Um, going on to, you might want to start with the abnormality. So you might say, oh, actually um, the right heart border is not very clear. And I think that there might be some 
uh, pneumonic changes there, so uh, a possible right middle lobe pneumonia um, or middle zone, should I say, when you're describing chest x-rays might be best to go with zones instead of lobes. So right middle zone, which is um, making the right heart bottom and clear. Um, you can comment on the airway central. Um, the heart is not enlarged. Diaphragm, but you can see there and the cosmetic angles uh, and you can't see anything as like fractures or anything like that. Uh, and this is the last chest x-ray. So what can you see here? Right, so um, just pop it in the chat box and we'll see what you can get. So this is the findings in this one. So you can see consolidation and the left lower zone, okay? Um, and you can see that the costophrenic are, angles are sharp. However, I'd say um, on the left side, you may not actually cast that sharp and you may be concerned that there is some lower left zone consolidation as well, okay? Um, and remember that you want to comment on the right as well. So is the right okay? Is that clear? Is that sharp? Um, and remember, you'd, you'd present it um, in a similar way. And remember the scoring systems for pneumonia. So this is probably what the management will be based on, so the CURB 65 score. And another thing to be aware of is that patients often have follow-up chest x-rays after they've been discharged four to six weeks after they started the treatment. And that's to check if there's any um, remaining consolidation or remaining problems. And that can be particularly useful if there, if, um, if there is something that's found, it could be quite suspicious for malignancy because if something still hasn't cleared up and it was treated and managed, then you might want to start considering malignancy. That's one of the reasons that chest x-rays are performed later on. And of course, to ensure that the pneumonia has resolved. So a bit about the CURB 65 score, I'm sure you're, all sure you're all aware of what it is. So confusion, a urea of more than seven, respiratory rate of more than 30, equal or more than 30, and a systolic whether, uh, and a blood pressure whether the systolic is less than 90, or the diastolic is equal to or less than uh, 60. Um, so follow your hospital guidelines. Remember that some medications can cause phlebitis if you're giving them IV, and remember allergies. Patients might be panallergic, so you might have to go with something like a microlide. Now, just remember that when you're clocking patients, especially on a medical take, smoking history can be quite important. In fact, it's very, very important because patients um, may come in with something else, okay? But then you realize that they're desaturating and you're getting concerned and you find out that this is just chest X-ray. So elderly gentleman is coming with confusion. You do a chest X-ray because he's desaturating and you look at the lungs and you, you, um, you think it's abnormal, okay? So what's abnormal about this one? Have a look and have a look at the ABG. So you find out he's smoking your history and he's got a 40 pack year history. He's got an acidotic pH. Uh, his PO2 is low, um, CO2 is high and bicarb is high. So what does this show? Does it show acute or chronic compensation of the kidneys? Feel free to um, uh, let us know what you think and we can go through that. Now, just going through it then, I'm sure a lot of you um, were able to get the answer. So it's type two respiratory failure, high carbon dioxide, low oxygen, and there's actually respiratory acidosis again. Okay, now with regards to the X-ray, you can see that the, um, the fields are hyper expanded. Okay, the diaphragm is flattened. You can see blunting of the angles because of the diaphragm being so flattened. Um, and you can see these um, chronic changes in the lungs as well. And another really, really useful thing to do in practice is always compare with previous chest x-rays. Because if you think something's abnormal, you can have a look uh, at the previous one and compare it and it can be really, really useful for that. Um, and just remember that in terms of bicarb, I'll go through that now with you. So this bicarb is high. When would you get a high bicarb? 
So you'd get a high bicarb if your kidneys have been compensating for a while now. So if you've been retaining carbon dioxide and that acid base equation is going towards the right, which I will show you, it means you've got more H plus, so more acidosis, your blood's more acidotic. So your kidneys will recognize that and you'll get more bicarb produced as a result to try and act as an equilibrium and to try and um, uh, neutralize the acid, uh, the acid, uh, the acidity, uh, acidity. And that's why you'll find that in chronic patients with chronic um, respiratory failure or chronically, um, who are chronic retainers rather of carbon dioxide, you'll see their bicarb is high. If there wasn't chronic compensation and this was actually an acute case, the bicarb would probably be normal or maybe a little bit low. And that's because the kidneys haven't really had time to compensate because kidneys can take hours to days. They can take a long time to compensate. And that's why you might not see compensation in all patients, okay? And it might be a sign of acute deterioration. Okay, um, so a few more things. Uh, pulmonary edema, just a quick, um, showing you the chest x-ray. You've got the bat wing sign uh, centrally. Uh, you've got cardiomegaly and um, et cetera. So congestion, uh, pleural effusion, just to be aware of, you'll see a meniscus sign uh, and have a look at that if you're not sure what that is. It's sort of a curvature of fluid. Um, often you might find that chronically in a patient who investigates. So a bit about the management, sit them upright. May, remember that sitting upright can help with breathing. Furosemide, GTN spray if the BP is okay. Remember to do a fluid balance uh, and make sure you're measuring that. Asthma attacks, a uh, really important, important one to know. Um, remember that there's severity markings. So what's the peak flow like? How is the respiratory rate? How's the heart rate? And a really important one to be aware of is the CO2. Is that in the normal range? When we say normal range, remember that in asthma, particularly life-threatening asthma, um, normal range is bad sign, okay? That should not be the case. Um, because if, if it's a normal range, it means that there's tiring, they're not getting rid of that CO2, and therefore that's a bad sign, and that's a sign of life-threatening asthma, okay? So just be very, very aware of that if you see that on an APG. Um, remember your steroids, your NEBS, uh, and your seniors if you're thinking about moving forwards in that management. Okay, COPD, um, remember um, different differentials, how it might present in your investigations uh, and your management. So again, steroids, NEBS, oxygen, as you may need it, antibiotic cover if you think it's an infective exacerbation, um, et cetera. Now a question for you all, um, 80 year old, ECOPD, so exacerbation of COPD on CPAP for the past few hours, now drowsy. And by the way, remember CPAP in a patient with type 2 respiratory failure is only going, it probably will just worsen the, uh, the problem because it will just pump the oxygen in and won't retain, won't take out the carbon dioxide. That's why you need BiPAP in type 2 respiratory failure. Whereas CPAP, the way I think about it, CPAP is sort of one way, it's better for providing oxygen. Whereas BiPAP is providing oxygen and removing carbon dioxide. So have a look at the screen. Have a look at these values. What's the first thing that you're going to do? So if we go through it, they have a low respiratory rate. SATSA, SATSA 99%. Acidotic, high CO2, high oxygen bicarb's high as well. So the first thing to do is what? Reduce the oxygen. Clearly the hypoxic drive is being suppressed here, okay? And don't worry if you didn't uh, get this one right, it's all about learning and learning for next time. So the hypoxic drive is being suppressed here because the way you can tell is the oxygen is so high and the CO2 resultantly or as a result has become so high because that patient is probably relying on the hypoxic drive to breathe, but 
when I say hypoxic drive, they rely on having a lower oxygen than what we might consider as normal to breathe, okay? Um, and because of them having a really high oxygen saturation, they're not breathing enough. So they're retaining that carbon dioxide and they'll really be poorly, okay? So stop that oxygen or reduce it, at least get those sats down to 88 and to see how they are and take it from there. These are just, uh, this is just a table, okay? Comparing type one and type two respiratory failure, including acute and acute on chronic. So you can see in the acute on chronic, um, you can see that the bicarb will be raised, like I mentioned, okay? And in the acute, actually the bicarb can be normal, rising from normal, um, or if it's been a few hours, it could, you know, it could be slightly raised as well. Um, but that's how you tell if it's acute or non-acute. Symptoms of signs of hypoxia we've been through um, and hypercapnia, I don't think we said, so headache, change of behavior, um, papilledema, the extremities could be quite warm and they become comatose. So just remember, they're very, very, very important um, things to be aware of. Acid base, or at, I mentioned, I will um, discuss with you the equation. So at the bottom, right of the screen, you've got the acid base equation. So H plus plus HCO3 minus makes um, H2CO3. And then that goes back into CO2 plus H H2O. Um, but what I do in my head, I actually think about, about it the other way around. CO2 plus H2O goes to H2CO3, H2CO3, and then H plus plus HCO3 minus, okay? Um, and these are just some tables of your normals and what happens in what? So in respiratory acidosis, alkalosis, and in compensation, okay? And again, feel free to pop any questions down now or uh, that can be picked up at the end or um, you can ask at the end as well, no problem. Type one respiratory failure, um, like I mentioned here, is where you just have hypoxia. So um, you don't have high carbon dioxide, you just have a low oxygen, okay? Um, and you can be severely hypoxemic uh, or, or just hypoxemic. So there's different gradings as well. So in terms of management, you think about how you can provide the oxygen and the underlying cause. So are they fluid overloaded? Have they got a um, exacerbation of some sort? So think about oxygen being controlled, etc. So this is an example. So you've got the PaO2 8.9, which of course is low. Type 2 respiratory failure. Like I mentioned, respiratory acidosis is a very concerning sign. Involve your seniors in, in what you're doing. Medical management. After an hour, make sure you're reassessing with the ABG. If they're not improving, they'll probably need an IV. Now, differences between ABG and VB, you might be get you might get told to do both. Okay, what they're both what they both have in common, they'll provide you with a bicarb and a lactate. Okay, an ABG will provide you with the oxygenation. It's arterial blood leaving the heart. Your tissues have not used it yet. So you'll get um, a normal and a high, hopefully high, but uh, a normal oxygen value. Um, and the CO2 will also be reflective of what you want to see. So uh, whether you're, because your body has not used it yet, your CO2 and oxygen values, you can use and interpret. In a VBG, however, the, the blood is venous. So exactly in its name, um, it will have a lower oxygen and a higher CO2. Um, and these we can't really use to assess the respiratory failure as, um, as I'm sure you understand. A few more slides to go. Um, pneumothorax, mucus plug-in and effusion. So think about these things when there's no air entry on one side. Okay, if there's normal vesicular breath sounds, is there a PE, is there AF? Um, is there respiratory depression? Uh, remember about all of, think about all of these things. And ECGs are very, very important, okay? Um, think about, have they got AF? Have they got fast AF? Um, are, they, are they having a cardiac event? Uh, a lot of uh, ECGs can be really, really useful. So remember you ask, remember to ask about that. A PE um, will be common that you find as a doctor um, and as a healthcare professional, um, you might come across a lot of patients with PEs. 
Remember to ask them about um, any sharp chest pain, which is pleuritic. So is it worse when you're breathing? Any hemoptysis, so coughing up of blood? Are they on any anticoagulant? I've come across patients who are already on anticoagulants, get a PE, and then they have to be changed to another anticoagulant. What's the most recent INR? Remember your investigations. So what's the scoring system that you use? Um, it's a world score. And I'm sure you'll know you need to assess those risk factors within that scoring system, which we'll go through. Do a G-dimer, do a CTPA. And if you really suspect PE, have a chat with your seniors and you might want to start them on therapeutic um, heparin as per your local policies and go from there with the CTPA. And remember chest x-rays are really important in PEs to rule out anything else. So a bit about well score. So these are the different parameters. Tachycardia, signs of a DVT, immobilization, um, uh, malignancy, hemoptysis, and previous PE. Um, once you get that score, there's different ways of interpreting it, okay? And um, just go with whatever your trust um, chooses or whatever you think is high risk. Um, you should definitely speak with the seniors and consider starting some management or further investigations. Uh, if they're scoring four or more, definitely consider a CTPA uh, and more of a workup. Um, so you can, you can do that. So uh, in terms of ABGs, remember that there's different bits of advice, okay, that I, I give. So feel the pulse, might be superficial, draw back your syringe, et cetera, et cetera. Let me take you to this slide. So when I, so when I started doing ABGs, you, you, the, the thing is ABG and practical procedures, you will always develop as you go up. So don't be concerned if you're doing ABGs and you're not being you're not being successful the first few times. Okay, it takes practice, and you need to um, understand the anatomy and how to do the procedure. So remember to palpate using your aseptic technique, etc. Remember the anatomy. So you've got the radial artery, and remember it can be superficial. It can be a little bit deeper. You've got your muscle tendons as well. Okay, and remember your radial artery. It can be quite lateral. All right. Um, and it can be quite high up as well in the uh, in the forearm. So go with where you feel the pulse best, okay? You can use two fingers to feel or one finger and you, you then put your needle in, okay? Remember to do uh, the test to check for radial and artery supply and consenting and speaking with the patient because this can be quite painful, even though it's quite, it can be quite quick, it can be quite painful. Um, and remember that you're speaking to them the whole time to make them comfortable, okay? Um, go in at an angle that's best for that, the anatomy of that patient, okay? Some patients you might need to go quite a sharp angle, some patients you might not need to, um, so it really depends. And then in some, with some syringes you might need to draw back first, some others you might not need to, okay? So it's all based on these, these different tips um, and these different things you think about. Um, when you get the blood, if it's shooting up automatically, probably arterial. And if it's of a lighter color, if it's darker, taking its time, might be mixed, might be venous. Run the gas. If the oxygenation is high, likely to be arterial. Uh, if it's low, likely to be venous. So these are the different things to be aware of. Coming towards the end now, okay. Um, further treatment, don't forget your circulation, disability and exposure. Um, if patients really deteriorating, remember that you need to contact the next of kin or part of the medical team can do that. Remember hypoxia kills, so get that high flow oxygen as soon as you can. Uh, venturi and reassess, okay? Reassess with the treatment you give and see what's working and what isn't. Okay, so I hope that was useful for everyone. Um, if you have a couple of minutes and um, please scan the QR code and I think the uh, feedback will be posted in the chat box so you can click on that link as well. Let us know what you think uh, and you can also get a certificate uh, for attendance that if you're junior doctors, whatever stage you're at, you can add to your portfolios uh, to show that you've attended this teaching. 
Uh, and just a big thank you to everybody. I hope that was uh, useful. Any questions, please pop them on the chat box and we can get right to them. Um, thank you very much, Samson. I'm just going to post the, the feedback link in the chat. Uh, and the, yeah, we're going to just wait a couple of minutes um, and, and answer any, of, any questions that anyone might have. Um, so we're just going to give you a couple of minutes and I'm going to um, hand over to Wendy to run the Q&A session in a second. Um, but just wanted to remind everyone Please join us next week for, for another session run by Dr. Lizzie. Um, and please make sure you sign up for the for the future webinars. Um, Have we got any questions? Um, no, not so far, but if you guys have any questions, pop it in the Facebook chat and I can read them out. It'd be really useful and some people can answer anything you need. But Thank you. obviously, if you can think of any later on, you can always post it on the YouTube channel as well and ask your questions over there. Um, if there are no questions, um, I think we're going to wrap it up here. Um, thank you, thank you very much, everyone. And if you if you do have any questions, as Wendy said, please do message us on Mind the Bleep um, or contact us via the YouTube channel. Please join us next week, um, and please make sure you fill in the feedback form uh, because if you do, you'll get the certificate of participation. And it's very informative for us to make sure the sessions um, are even better for you. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next week. <laughs>